All of us today who are concerned about education are facing probably the greatest crisis of this century. And it is not primarily a crisis of resources. It is a crisis of ideas. It's 1969. Edward Short is Labour's Education Secretary and an enthusiast for comprehensive education. But in a speech to the National Union of Teachers, he warns that the new schools face a serious threat, something called the Black Paper. In my view, the publication of the Black Paper was one of the blackest days for education in the past century. These were scurrilous documents, quite disgraceful. Almost 40 years later, Edward Short, now Lord Glenamara, remains as furious with the Black Paper Project as he was at the time. But what was this dark threat to the welfare of our youngsters? It wasn't asbestos in school buildings or a shortage of books. It was a series of essays called The Black Papers from several authors, each attacking the trend towards progressive education. One of the founding editors was Brian Cox, a professor of English at Manchester University. We got lots of letters from teachers saying that if you're going to criticise egalitarianism, you really need to look at the situation in the schools, that is, comprehensive schools and, above all, the non-structure permissive education, which was very fashionable at that time. The teaching profession were horrified in many cases by the way in which old structures were being destroyed. But the leaders of education, and say the colleges of education, were promulgating these ideas, and so therefore Increasingly, many people, I'm one of them, felt that they had to interfere in what was going on. The atmosphere is very informal. Words like grammar, punctuation, dictation are not much heard, and the emphasis is on stimulating the child's maximum interest. The black paper attack on these new ways of teaching was seen as the education equivalent of Enoch Powell. The papers were condemned by fervent supporters of comprehensives, from government advisers to radical teachers. I remember my reaction to the Black Papers being one of profound fury. I mean, I just didn't like the feel of it. I knew what it was about. It was about the defence of the old social order, in my view. I quoted the opinion of my friend that they were the Ku Klux Klan in mortarboards. It was an era of virulent ideological debate, as Education Secretary Edward Short, Lord Glenamara, makes clear. They were attacking me because I was pushing the comprehensive reorganisation as hard as I could. These were people who wanted to continue dividing the nation's children up into 20% success and 80% failures, which is absolute nonsense. We were saying to people who had been powerful protagonists of egalitarianism that they were causing great damage in the schools. So it's not surprising that it produced an immense reaction. So what was going on in the schools? In the 1970s, under Tory government and Labour, most secondary schools became comprehensive. We were meant to enter a wonderful new era, but did the educationalists botch the delivery of comprehensive education? Did practical difficulties and ideological shibboleths disrupt the transition to non-selective schools? Scotland and Northern Ireland were different, but across England and Wales, schools were putting the comprehensive idea into practice. My own school, Dorking Grammar, was swept up in it. It was merged with the secondary modern next door to create a new school with a new name. Well, here we are in Dorking, heart of Surrey, and my old school, the Ashcombe School. The Ashcombe School, that was a very important point at the time the school was created. Jill Goswell was my old English teacher. The grammar school became upper school, which was for years four and five, and the Mowbray building was for the lower school pupils. And it was just these are the buildings, these are the books, do what you can with them. At least at my school the merged buildings were next door to each other, but not everyone was that fortunate, as a documentary at the time observed. It's three buildings roughly on the corners of a triangle, a quarter of a mile between each corner. And when you're walking along with a piece of equipment and a pile of books and it's raining horizontally at you, it's dreadful. Shirley Williams was a junior education minister in the late 60s and was education secretary from 1976 to 79. Most new schools that were built in new towns or new areas really swallowed almost all the money. There was very little left over for 
renovatory building. So you've got counties like Cambridgeshire and Hertfordshire, at that time largely conservative, developing a comprehensive system, in fact, usually a very good comprehensive system, whereas old towns like Manchester or London, unable to new build, were stuck with having to link together four or five different sites, often far apart or with very busy roads crisscrossing them. Pretty unsatisfactory outcome. When it went comprehensive, it was merged with another school two miles up the road. Now, at public expense, fleets of taxis ferry teachers to and fro between the two schools. Split site or new building, the obvious feature of the new comps was their gargantuan size. My school doubled in numbers overnight. So why did they make comps so big? It was all about having enough students staying on to sustain viable sixth forms. In the more comfortable counties of the southeast, the staying on rate, even in those years, was around about 40-50%. In South Wales, where it was relatively low, you've got huge comprehensive schools where the head had no chance of even knowing the names of the teachers, let alone the names of the kids. Schools had to create manageable units. At Ashcombe, we had a lower school, an upper school, a new house system and year heads. And in comps across the country, a whole new class structure emerged. One, 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 two. What stream are you in? The academic. One C. 7XS. 413. I'm a technical stream. 1W. Commercial, academic and general. 1X, Y and Z. This was often about streaming, keeping the children in separate classes according to their ability, rather as they had done in the grammar system, in fact. We were in 1B and we were then put into the A stream in the second year, and uh, the people who had been in 1A resented that. There was six classes in the H stream and six in the P stream, Holland Park. And I was in 1H1, which was the top of the H stream. And that was, was funny enough, all the blonde middle class girls were in 1H1. What they did is they divided us into two blocks. They had block one and block two. And no qualitative judgment was made on either block, except that block one, we were taught Latin. And block two, they were told... You look after the rabbits. John O'Farrell on Desborough School in Maidenhead, Melissa Benn on Holland Park, and Chris Courtney on Rising Hill, both in London. The grammar school pupils were protected. They were still taught as grammar school streams. At the Ashcombe School, streaming was one strategy for minimising the inevitable upheavals of such a big change. The grammar school pupils' parents had been promised that their children would continue to receive a grammar school education. So they were very much designated the A-band. Certainly the pupils in upper school were suspicious. I went into quite a few classes to be asked, are you from Mowbray? I think that was from your class. <laughs> no, oh, that's all right then. Teachers like Jill Goswell struggled with the everyday practicalities of making new schools work on the ground. But before the basic comprehensive system had been allowed to settle down, some of its keener proponents had already had a new idea. If the point of comps was to mix everyone up in one single school without labelling them successes or failures, why have grammar streams? Why not mix everybody up, regardless of ability, in one single class? This idea, mixed ability teaching, became the front line in a new ideological battle. Campaigning teachers like Clyde Chitty of the Comprehensive Schools Committee met at a conference at the Institute of Education in London one Saturday in 1966. At the time, yes, I think it's true to say we did feel that it was the next stage in the movement. Many of us who were at that conference were carried away by the enthusiasm of the speakers. I think it was always a minority of very, very enthusiastic committee teachers, the people who addressed that conference, were absolutely convinced that mixed ability teaching was the next stage. The black paper writers were worried. The psychologist Richard Lynn, for one, read about the conference in the newspapers. There was much discussion at this conference on the merits of the unstreamed comprehensive. And the teacher would try to teach children with a very wide range of abilities. This certainly was one of the events which set alarm bells ringing in my mind. In my second black paper, I concentrated particularly on the issue of streaming. We thought that if we have to have comprehensives, streamed comprehensives are the best model. By now, most comprehensives would have divided these boys into different streams. But here, the teacher has to share his time between GCE O-level candidates 
and boys who can hardly read. The BBC reported on Woodland School, a boys' comprehensive in Coventry. It interviewed the head, Donald Thompson, who for years had been an evangelist for abandoning streaming in favour of mixed ability. My top educational priority for this school is not school work. Neither is it the achievement of good examination results. If your top educational objectives are to do with doing well at schools... ...by many pupils is deadly. I mean, it was death by a million worksheets. Now, that doesn't seem to me to be, in terms of pedagogy, justifiable. You've got group work becoming the norm. And that almost meant that the role of the teacher was becoming diminished, not just a conveyor of knowledge, but as somebody who was there to stimulate and excite the pupils. Woodland's mixability teaching was one thing, but the school did not embody the most permissive approach to education. Boys' haircuts had to be regulation length. But nearby, far more radical things were going on. In Leicestershire, Counterstop College was not just teaching mixability classes, it was run by a democratic council of staff. Ivor Goodson was an enthusiastic teacher there. You're talking about a huge shift in the social order of schooling here, from bells ringing, people moving in a regimented way, people sitting in rows, which is one vision of classrooms, to something profoundly different, which has humour, personal interaction, warmth and movement. What Countess Thorpe took seriously, which I think many others did not, was the notion that if you were to socially mix people, and get mixed ability classes, you would have to think very seriously about how the classroom was organised and how the curriculum was organised. If you didn't do that, you would just end up with the comprehensive experiment failing because it was trying to use grammar school methods to achieve comprehensive aims. Martin Allen is now a company director but was a student there in the early 1970s. There was problems within the school because of the very slack atmosphere there Pupils would go to the lessons that they wanted to. A lot of pupils were allowed to go out into the local town doing so-called research at museums and things like this. And that was always a good opportunity for a sky. Mathematics was not a strong point of mine, and it got to the point where I was actually allowed to drop that subject. And that really is a sad indictment. I think I was able then to take up an extra sports lesson, which was to a 14-year-old, absolutely wonderful, but uh, retrospectively, not necessarily the best thing. There are huge cohorts of kids who did not do well in old schooling. When you've got 80% of kids being sent to secondary moderns, this wasn't a small, deviant group. This was a large majority who were being failed. That group, without any doubt, in my view, prospered quite magnificently in many ways in the school. For Martin Allen, this wasn't the case. We had a council estate upbringing, and sadly, my parents were unable to give me much assistance. So I needed to be taught and to be shown how to learn, and that's the greatest shame, that I was never really shown how to learn. Idealism and radicalism were running ahead of themselves. Even pro-comp teachers were getting sceptical. Max Morris was a headmaster in London, a lifelong left-winger, a supporter of comprehensives since the 1930s. He saw young radical teachers arrive at his school in Brent. We had some who were really over the top. They were nice people, very nice people, but they thought that all you had to do was to have kids all together and they would automatically be pushed up to anywhere, to any heights. Well, it's just not true. It's just a utopian, it's not true. And they didn't realise how hard it was to raise standards. You've got to keep hard at it, you know, or children fall back. If it couldn't win over Max Morris, radical egalitarianism was never going to become the norm, nor was all-out mixed ability teaching. Black paper author Richard Lynn notched this up as a significant victory. Some children will have a mental age of average 13 or 14-year-old, and other children will have a mental age of 7 or 8. You've got a huge range of aptitude and it's just not cost effective to try to teach all these children in the same class. It cannot work efficiently. Although we lost the battle to save the grammar schools, I think we pretty well won the battle on streaming in comprehensives. When did it cease to be an issue? I mean, when did it no longer become a sort of litmus test of your purity of thought <laughs> about comprehensive education and what it meant? Around the mid-70s a lot of things began to go wrong. We'd had the black papers. It was possible to attack comprehensive education for the first time and get a lot of popular support for what you were saying. Television programmes, radio programmes, suggesting that comprehensive schools were out of control. 
that there was no discipline, no structure, no organisation. At that time, it became necessary for many of us to, to rethink certain situations. And if we were going to be regarded as the loony left because we were going all out for mixed ability teaching at a time when the whole principle was under attack, I think it was a time when we had to step back and say, look, we, we've got to make sure that we carry popular support with us. As Clyde Chitty points out, it was the perception of events on the ground that mattered. Arguably, the proponents of comps had spent too long asserting they worked in theory, and not nearly long enough making them work in practice. Radicalism was giving the new schools a bad name. There was an outcry over an Islington school called William Tyndale. Comprehensive head Max Morris was as appalled as anyone at the school's approach. They did want to teach people writing because there were typewriters in existence, daft things like that. I knew the teachers there very well. They did us no good. They didn't help the movement at all. But uh, they were the exceptions, I can assure you. The vast majority of teachers had their feet on the ground. Most crucially, Tyndale was not a comprehensive. It was a primary school. The comps were being tarnished by developments that went far beyond the idea of non-selective secondary education. But it was always the extreme examples that caught media attention. The BBC produced a controversial edition of Panorama about Faraday School in Ealing, portraying it as thoroughly chaotic. The short chairs. Well, now we're going to sort out. Battles in the classroom, ideological battles outside. Comps were caught up in the 70s spirit of strife, disappointment, and ill discipline. Of course, comps couldn't be blamed for punk rock, flying pickets or marital breakdown in the royal family. A lot was going on in society. But the comps' image, and reality, did reflect the troubles of the time. There were even hostile articles about them in The Guardian. And there was a provocative play staged in London in 1978, written by the young left-winger Nigel Williams. It was called Class Enemy. A schoolroom in South London. The classroom is a desert, huge cracks in the walls, desks battered out of shape, and windows, if there are any windows, shattered. Everything has been scrawled on or broken. In the play, a class is deserted by its teachers, unable to keep control. William's inspiration for it sprang from an encounter at a real school that touched a personal chord. That particular schoolroom came into my head because I was making a documentary about uh, Irish traditional music and the fiddle player in the band was a, a janitor at a comprehensive school in North London. I went to film Bobby at the school, walking around the playground, and there was kind of a riot. The kids were so sort of completely out of control, they tried to grab our equipment. And I followed them up. I thought, this is an amazingly interesting thing. I followed them up to the classroom where there was a guy smoking a joint and there, there all the equipment was broken. So I saw anarchy, and I saw nihilism, and I saw desperation. It just seemed to me absolutely shocking to me, as the son of a grammar school headmaster, and my father had run a very good, well-organised grammar school in Kilburn, which had been destroyed by the comprehensive system, to see this absolute sort of first circle of hell situation, where... Quite clearly, the school was completely out of control. It was a very vivid thing for me. It stayed in my mind, and that's really why I wrote the play. It's a vivid image, and it's stuck to some extent. In a moment, former Black Paper editor Brian Cox. But first, former Labour MP Chris Price. Comprehensive schools were associated in the early days with freedom in education. Do what you like. And therefore, you've got sort of scandals where schools were out of control. Now, that was one reason why comprehensives got a bit of a bad name, whereas most of the comprehensives in the suburbs and the countryside were staid, pleasant places where kids worked hard and are now gone on to be famous television interviewers and things like that. Do you think the comprehensives were, in a way, a bit unlucky, coming along as an idea for organising schools at the same time as a set of values and principles of progressive education and progressive teaching? I think they were extremely unlucky. We, in our campaigns, were largely concerned with unstructured, permissive education, which was so fashionable and led to all sorts of problems, particularly the breakdown of discipline in the schools. That really had nothing to do with the way comprehensive schools were intended to operate. 
By the end of the 70s, the momentum towards comprehensive education had gone. In Tameside, for example, in Greater Manchester, a Tory council reversed Labour plans to go comprehensive. A messy and prolonged legal battle ensued. Shirley Williams was the last Labour Education Secretary before the Thatcher government swept to power in 1979. The variation between comprehensive schools was greater than the variation between grammar and secondary modern. And that had to do with whether they had been essentially supported as schools or whether they were essentially seen as battlegrounds. And I think quite a few were seen as battlegrounds, though not, in my view, enough to suggest the experiment was wrong. I'm still strongly in favour of it. In 1976, something changed. The Prime Minister intervened in the debate. James Callaghan gave a speech at Ruskin College, Oxford. It was a turning point, a gentle but firm speech, arguing that standards did matter, progressive methods had gone too far, and that schools needed to serve our economy's ever-increasing need for educated workers. A journalist suggested that Mr Callaghan had wrapped himself in a black paper cloak. You were Secretary of State when he gave that speech. I've been there for about two weeks. Did he tell you he was going to do that? Yes, he told me, but he didn't tell me in detail. And I think when I look back on it, I thought that a number of the things he said were actually extremely wise, particularly the emphasis he put on the need for self-discipline among teachers if you're going to have self-discipline among pupils. He was quite right about that. I was probably a bit too... A libertarian, in a way, in allowing teachers a great scope. Certainly, there was a change in perceptions, that the black papers had moved from the far right to the mainstream, and that the more radical proponents of comps had moved from the mainstream to the loony left. Brian Cox. I would like to say that with regard to non-structured education, we won the debate. And eventually, of course, Callaghan made his famous speech, where one felt the Labour Party had begun to change as well. By 1979, there were 3,203 comps in England and Wales, teaching 80% of state secondary pupils. Some were undoubtedly Nigel Williams' vision of hell, some hotbeds of radicalism. But not my school in Dorking, and not, I suspect, most others. Certainly the creation of my comp caused upheaval, but in the end, the new school served a lot of us well. At Ashcombe, at the end of the new school's first year, My English teacher, Jill Goswell, and her colleague, Ian Meller, were busy arranging the first-ever school arts festival and concocting a utopian musical about, guess what? The merger of a grammar school and the secondary modern next door. And Evan, you were playing a grammar school teacher. To teach Latin and Greek is my one desire. Not a lot of Greek was taught at our old grammar school, in truth. To light a classical fire in the soul of man, leading my life through the valley of truth under constant fire from the examiner man. Conjugation, declamation, agitation, success. Oxford or Cambridge, never anything less. So that's a sort of caricature, I suppose, of the old grammar school thing. Oh, well, here at the end it gets a bit bit soppy. The boy sings, in your arms everything is possible, we shall cross the universe. And the girl sings, when I'm with you every dream comes true. And then the chorus sings, Ashcombe, Ashcombe, Ashcombe rules. And I think grammar and secondary modern live in perfect harmony thereafter.